Well, I've got some chain and sprockets to mount up on the RM250 today. I'm in the mood to just grind this out. No dicking around, let's get right to it. These are the parts I'll be using today. We have a Pro-X X-Ring gold chain. Look at that beautiful gold plating on there. That is gonna look awesome on the bike. Pro-X front sprocket. The rear sprocket is Pro-X as well. It's already mounted up. So let's start by getting this front sprocket on. Man, that's a cool looking sprocket. So usually sprockets go on with the numbers or the stampings facing outward. This sprocket is two-sided as you can see, so you wanna make sure you get it right. Looks like going on, but it's kinda of hitting that chain slider. They must have made that chain slider a little too thick. This is a, actually a stock size sprocket. I'll we'll have to trim that slider a little bit. We give it a little buff jaw with abrasive wheel on a dremel. Oh yeah, she's eating. Butter. And we've got a circlip. Just push it on until it snaps into the groove. You'll hear it. There we go. So if your front sprocket has a bolt or a nut that holds it on, you can use a sprocket holding tool such as this. Just put it through the holes in the sprocket or you can grab it like this and that'll allow you to torque that bolt or the nut onto the counter shaft. Bust out the cock and I always like to put a bead of silicone on the circlip just as a little extra insurance and of course you want to make it look pretty as well. Now to feed the chain through I just drop it onto the rear sprocket, spin it up towards the front sprocket, hook it on to the front sprocket, spin that around Pull it through the bottom of the frame and then just feed it through the chain guide. And we're gonna make our connection here on the rear sprocket. So I'm gonna start with the rear wheel all the way forward in the swing arm with these adjuster bolts sucked all the way in. That way as the chain stretches, we can pull the wheel back to compensate for that. And to hold the wheel all the way forward, just gonna snug up the axle and then pull the chain all the way tight like that. I can't get any more links out of it, so it's gonna be pretty loose for now. This is where we're gonna pop the plates off and join the chain, just so we don't accidentally cut this chain too short. Make a little mark. So basically how this works is I'm gonna push in these two pins, that's gonna release this outer plate, and the rest of the links will just come off after that. The tool we'll be using for this is a Motion Pro chain splitter. So all you do is lock it over the chain, tighten it down, then you have an inner sleeve here, or an inner bolt that pushes that pin through the chain. Works pretty slick. So what you wanna do is have this inner thread backed all the way out, tighten down your outer, and just go hand tight, and then tighten up the inner. Oh yeah, she pushed right on through. Just gotta hit this other pin and we'll be good to go. So this chain comes with a master link, but if it didn't, and I, or I didn't want to run a master link for whatever reason, I could just pop this pin out only, slide it through, put this on, have these outer plates connect to here, pop that pin through, and I'd be good to go, but I'm gonna run a master link on this chain. And then the rest of the links just pop right off. Now when you connect your chain together, you wanna to make sure the two inner parts are matching up. If your chain came together like this, obviously that wouldn't work because the master link wouldn't be able to connect these two. There's a few things to consider here when determining your chain length. The first would be wheelbase. So if you pull your wheel all the way back like that, then your bike's gonna be longer and that will actually affect the handling characteristics as well. So the longer the wheelbase, the more stable it's gonna be, but the slower it'll turn. Now when you bring the wheel all the way forward, this will shorten the wheelbase, and in turn, the bike will turn sharper. So kind of comes down to your preference there, and of course, the bike, kind of a inherent um, handling characteristics of it. Another thing to think about too is the more you bring the wheel back, the longer the chain will be, and therefore the heavier the chain will be 
and that will rob some power. So if you bring your wheel all the way back like this, we would be about three links longer here and that would equate to about a one and a half ounce heavier chain since it's about half an ounce per link, which is basically the difference between a sealed chain and a non-sealed standard chain. Now, if you want the most power possible and the least amount of weight, run a standard chain and suck your wheel all the way up as far as possible. Now, there's one last thing to think about too, is when you bring your wheel all the way forward, if you ever decide to go to a larger sprocket, you won't have enough chain length to accommodate that larger sprocket. So make sure you save the extra links of your chain. You can press them in with a chain press. A simple tool like this will allow you to press extra links onto your chain. So I hope that simplifies things for you, but my personal preference is to run the wheel all the way forward. Since I don't usually change sprocket sizes, I usually just go stock size sprockets, which that's what I did on this bike and I prefer my bikes to turn a little sharper. So that is why I go with the shorter wheelbase and shorter chain, and I like more power. I wanna make sure you retain the O-rings here, and we're gonna meet it up with the rest of the chain. Make sure the other side of the chain has O-rings as well. So this chain comes with a little packet of grease as well. Dab some on this master link. And the master link is gonna slide in from the back side. Make sure those seals are still on there. And on goes the outer plate. Yeah, these are usually pretty tight tolerances, so you might have to tap them on or squeeze them on with some pliers. Better than it being loose, that's for sure. Just go until that little groove is exposed for the master link clip. And for the clip, you don't want it facing the direction that the chain is traveling. So if your wheel spins like that, you want the closed end right here. And obviously if it's facing the other way, it could pop off if a stick hits the front of it or a rock or what have you. I just use needle nose pliers to pop this on. So just as long as you can see these two halves close together, you're good to go and that clip is in the groove. I'm gonna put some silicone on this as well. I need to clean off some grease with contact cleaner. And there we have it for the chain. Just gotta set the tension. A couple things to hit on before we proceed with the rest of the video. This bike that we're building here will be given away when it is all done. Make sure you go sign up for that giveaway. It is completely free to enter. Just my way of giving back to you guys who support the channel. And if you see anything throughout the video that you'd like to grab for yourself, such as the tools or parts, I'll have all that linked down below in the description as well as that giveaway. And when you purchase from those links, that allows me to continue bringing this content to you guys free of charge. I try to make these videos as helpful and entertaining as possible without stuffing your face full of ads. I could probably make an additional, did I just spit on the camera? probably make an additional 50K a year running ads and sponsored slots on the channel, but I choose not to. I prefer to bring you guys content that is valuable and completely unbiased, and I don't really like having people tell me what to say or do on the channel. It is completely my channel and my voice, so that is probably why I don't have a lot of sponsors by choice, but hope you guys recognize that and appreciate that. Now, before I set that chain tension, I'm gonna pop on some fresh rollers. These ones are from Pro X as well. Looks like we have both the upper and lower are the same size. Yeah, these Pro X chain rollers are the way to go. It's like a self lubricating nylon, but still soft. It has like these little cushioning holes here, so you don't get a ton of chain slap, but let's bolt these things up. Now for the chain roller, I like to run a washer on either side with a little blue Loctite, of course. This is what Ron looks like on crack. Oh yeah, she's nice and smooth. Now we can set the chain tension. Obviously you'll want the rear axle loose. So we're pretty loose right there. I'm gonna start backing out these adjuster bolts until we're kind of in the area where we need to be. So I'll run three fingers worth of tension at the end of the chain slider here. So that is pretty close. So I'm about two and a half marks 
from the front on the left side. I'm gonna match that on the right side. Check the chain tension again. Now three fingers worth of slack is usually about 40 to 50 millimeters in the middle of the swing arm. Now if you got fat or uh, skinny fingers, you may just wanna measure it with a set of calipers. And also another thing you can do when you're checking the slack is push the chain down, let it settle, then measure it. So that's right at 41 millimeter. So that's, that's pretty good. That's right about where I usually run it. Now obviously chain slack is very important. If you run it too loose, you run the risk of the chain derailing, going through your case and uh, possibly getting injured from it. If you're running too tight of a chain, that'll wear the sprockets out prematurely, wear the chain out, and your suspension is actually not gonna work the same because as you are riding and your suspension's compressing, the chain is actually binding everything up. So it'll feel like your suspension's really stiff. And another thing too is when you're setting the chain, make sure the rear wheel is off the ground. If you are under the weight of the bike, that'll actually affect the chain tension as well. Make sure you have all your chain rollers installed, your chain guide, just so that way those variables are completely ruled out. Now, before we do the final slack adjustment, I like to run a reg in between the chain sprocket, kind of lock that in. That way the wheel is pulled all the way forward to these chain adjuster bolts. And I don't really trust these marks in the swing arm. I'm just gonna manually measure them with a set of calipers here. And some people will go to the block. I don't really trust the block either. Sometimes they can be off a little bit, especially if they're aftermarket blocks. So I'm gonna go directly to the axle and I'm gonna go behind the block. So I'm gonna measure from the back of the swing arm to the actual axle shaft. And I believe that's the most accurate way to measure this. So we're at 32.48 on the left side. It's actually pretty close, 32.64. I'm just gonna make a little tweak and we'll be good to go. And what you can do is just hold the caliper on there and turn the bolt. There we have it, spot on. So the reason why it's so crucial to have your axle perfectly aligned from one side to the other is it just makes everything work smoother. The chain and sprockets will be lined up perfectly, the brake rotor with the brake caliper, and it'll put less wear and tear on all those components as well as the wheel bearings. Now that we have the axle perfectly aligned on both sides, let's check these marks again. See how accurate they actually are. This one's like two and, I don't know, I'd say two thirds, but these marks are so wide, you can't really eye them up that well. So two and two thirds on the left side. The right side is more like right at three. Yeah, you can't really trust the blocks that much. One thing you'll notice with X-ring or O-ring chains is they look tighter than they actually are because they hold their shape better. They don't really droop as much. So don't let that fool you. Grab your calipers or stick your fingers in there and just uh, use your little three finger tool to measure it. And of course, when you're all done with your chain slack, throw a reg in there, bring the wheel all the way forward and tighten up that axle. I'm actually gonna torque this one. I believe the spec is somewhere around 80 foot pounds for these Suzuki's. If you guys know where to get a locking nut for these Suzuki's, let me know. It's kind of a weird thread diameter and pitch. The Honda threads are way bigger and it won't fit on here. Now a little tidbit about the rear sprocket. Of course, your bolts need to be Loctited or have a locking style nut on them. That's probably one of the most common bolts that back out and can cause some serious damage on a bike. So once the sprocket bolts are tight, what I like to do is make a mark up the bolt and onto the nut and that'll tell you if the nut starts backing out. After the first ride, you'll notice these bolts might back out a little bit. So keep an eye on them. And then of course, when you're all done with your chain adjustments, you wanna tighten down that lock nut on your chain adjuster bolt. Something that's overlooked on a lot of bikes is the chain adjuster bolts. Quite frequently, they seize up in the swing arms, which is actually the case on this one. It was a huge pain in the butt to get it out. So I would recommend putting anti-seize lubricant on those threads. You'll thank yourself later. One more little touch we're gonna to add to the bike is a front sprocket cover. And I'm not a big fan of the gray, so I'm gonna dye it black. And while I'm at it, got a few other 
white plastic pieces here to dye as well. This is the product I use for dyeing. RIT ProLine works a lot better than the traditional RIT. Very strong, you wanna use gloves and uh, wear dark clothing. Basically, I mix it up in a pot just with water and I use one scoop, this comes with a scooper, per quart of water. Drop the parts in. Sometimes they'll float, sometimes they'll sink. And for the parts that like to float, I put a little weight on top of them. And you'll notice I'm on a stove top here and I heat up the dye solution over a period of six hours. I have it on number two. Make sure you put a lid on so it doesn't all evaporate. And I'll leave that for six hours. Once that's done, I'll turn the burner off, leave it for another 12 hours, and those things are completely black. Let's take a peek at these plastic parts and see how they died out. So this is the rotor guard. Oh, that's not looking too good. Didn't really take the dye. Oh yeah, that's black. That looks really good. That looks pretty good as well. It's interesting how different types of plastics will accept that dye and others won't. Yeah, all these parts look pretty solid besides the rotor guard. So I'll just rinse the parts off, all the extra dye. Yeah, that does not look very good. Sometimes the black can look kind of purplish in the sun, but this one actually looks like jet black. Like I was saying, some of these parts will turn out kind of purplish and others black. This brake line guide is a bit purple for my liking, but the sprocket cover turned out just perfect. So it really boils down to the type of plastic. It's kind of hit and miss. What I'm gonna try with these two parts is giving them a little bit of prep with some glass bead. Hopefully that'll open up the plastic and allow that dye to set in. So I'm blasting these parts with a medium grade glass bead at around 80 PSI. And back into the dye we go. Now a few other variables you can mess with if you're not getting a good finish is adding more of the dye or increasing the temperature or just increasing the amount of time that they sit in the dye bath. Got the little case saver, need to clean up. Time for a buff job. You know why Joe Biden went to Target? So. Uh, well, he doesn't know either. <laughs> I got dad jokes up the wazoo now. Better watch out. The wazoo, is that a freaking old man term too? Uh -huh. Ah, shit, dude, I'm getting old. Got some freshy bolts for it. See if we can't get this brake line guide on without snap it in half. Oh, it's gonna be a squeeze. Maybe not. get much cleaner than that. It is the next day. Let's take a peek at these parts that I redid. Ooh, that is looking a little bit better. Yeah, same with that guide. I'm looking a little more black this time. Much, much better this time. I'm actually really pumped with this brake line guide. It has like a flat black look to it. That blasting really helped it out. No more purple there. As for the guard, it has kind of a gray greenish hue as you can see compared to the guide. So I'm gonna blast it with a more aggressive media, help open up that plastic some more, and then also use a higher concentrated dye, maybe two scoops per quart instead of one. I'll let you guys know how that goes. Probably have to update you in a future video. Well, that's a wrap on today. Hopefully you guys can take something from this video, even just one thing, and apply it to your builds and make your projects better. That is the whole goal of this channel, is to make all of us better. I learn a lot throughout doing these videos. Even this video, there's a few things that I picked up on just from messing around and trying things out. That is the beauty of filming this content is I really get to look at things in depth and analyze it further than rather than just bolting parts on and uh, calling it a day, you know. But I'm happy with the bit of progress we made today. It wasn't a huge step forward, but I'm excited to bring you the next video where we're gonna be bolting on a whole slew of parts and really dialing this bike in. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Anyways, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, guys. Remember to be very grateful for the people that surround you as well as the things that you hold near and dear, such as your health, the roof over your head, the food you eat, and the basic human needs that are met. Hopefully these last couple years have all taught us all that these things can change in a hurry. 
and we need to give thanks for those things. And also, we have a lot of people and institutions, corporations trying to take these things from us. And so it's very important to stick up for those things and put your foot down when your basic human needs and rights, your God-given rights are being trampled on. So remember that not just to be thankful, but to stand up for these things or else they will be taken away. Another way to look at gratefulness is if you can't be thankful for the things you have now and the people you have now, how can you ever accomplish and achieve more in life? It's pretty hard to move forward if you're not thankful for those things. So something to think about. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and this short little message. Thanks for supporting the channel. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.